Stuart, what can we learn about brain function from the process of anesthesia? Well, as you know, the brain is considered 100 billion neurons acting as switches. Each neuron integrates and fires. Anesthesia does not affect firing. In fact, anesthesia does not affect a lot of brain activity. We use evoked potentials under anesthesia, uh, for example, to measure spinal cord integrity when we're doing spine surgery. Uh, it, and sensory inputs come in from, to the thalamus are projected to the primary cortex, then uh, feed forward to the front of the brain and then to the back of the brain, kind of a three-wave process. And it's the third wave and only the third wave that is inhibited by anesthesia. And these culminate in pyramidal cell neurons, which are the ultimate integrators of brain processing. And uh, these uh, pyramidal cell uh, neurons have apical dendrites, which give rise to EEG. So when we're re measuring EEG, it's really these pyramidal cell dendrites. So it's really uh, interesting why this third wave uh, and only the third wave is, is affected by all types of anesthesia, gas anesthetics, propofol, and ketamine. Now, for the gas anesthetics, uh, interesting, most people have assumed for many years that anesthetic, anesthetics act on uh, receptors, postsynaptic receptors. It's pretty clear it's dendrites and soma, not firings. Firings are not uh, inhibited by anesthesia. But on the uh, postsynaptic side, uh, we know that the dendri dendritic integration is inhibited. People have assumed it's at the membrane receptors. But in the last five, six, seven years, work by Rod Eckenhoff at the University of Pennsylvania has shown that anesthetics actually act on microtubules. Now, the binding is tighter to membrane receptors, membrane proteins, serotonin, GABA receptors, for example, but there's, but uh, maybe by a thousand fold to what uh, binding to tubulin, but there's about 10,000 times more tubulin binding sites uh, per neuron than membrane proteins. And uh, uh, Eckenhoff showed that anesthetics bind to about 70 proteins uh, in a neuron at one MAC at the effective dose. And then the genomic proteomic analysis and show that the, uh, the proteins whose gene expression was changed the most was, was tubulin, suggesting that tubulin is mediating the functional aspect of it. He's done subsequent studies uh, with uh, tadpoles, actually, using optogenetics, very clever experiments, showing that uh, the anesthetic action is on microtubules, not on membrane proteins. So it's looking more and more, although this is still new information that hasn't really filtered through, that anesthesia acts on microtubules, probably by preventing quantum dipoles and quantum channels that have been identified along that act as topological qubits in our, in our ORCOR model. So um, I think that anesthesia, the anesthesia story is, is, is supporting and will continue to support more and more the idea that consciousness occurs in microtubules. And the fact that it's so easily reversible, especially by a good anesthesiologist. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, the, the gases act strictly by quantum forces. They act by London uh, 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 dipole dispersion forces. They don't form chemical bonds. They don't form ionic bonds. Uh, you breathe them in, they float, uh, uh, they go into the lung and take in the blood and go to nonpolar hydrophobic regions everywhere in the body, including uh, the brain, of course. And this has been known since uh, Meyer and Overton over 100 years ago. And and uh, which uh, nonpolar regions is now pointing more and more to microtubules, which uh, where you have these helical quantum channels that, that mediate uh, the uh, the quantum computing that we need in our model anyway. So I, I think uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, it's it's going to help us. It's pointing towards uh, microtubules as the 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 site of consciousness. Well, uh, this is certainly a, a passion and uh, some would say an obsession that you have. That's uh, an obsession. <laughs> <laughs> so we we'll have that on the table. Um, how about other factors that the microtubules may do? What about memory? Yeah, I think that uh, memories and microtubules, you know, most people say uh, memories and synaptic plasticity, the, right. the threshold, that are, but the proteins that make up a uh, synapse uh, are uh, transient and last hours to days and they're recycled, yet memories can last lifetimes. There's uh, good evidence from, uh, from Travis Craddock and Jack Tosinski, uh, for example, where um, um, there's an enzyme called calcium calmodulin kinase 2, CAMK2. So in long-term potentiation, LTP, a good model for memory, these come in, are, are activate, our calcium comes in, uh, activates CAMK2 in this hexagonal uh, holoenzyme that kind of looks like a, a snowflake with, with legs, six legs. And we've shown that, that this matches perfectly the, uh, and can uh, the geometry of microtubules and um, it, it affiliates with microtubules and spreads out over a, a big area and can phosphorylate six bits of information per CAM K2 and thousands come in with every uh, influx. So uh, the, uh, microtubules are, are the best candidate uh, for memory. So is the claim that an individual memory or, or the, 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 the smallest amount of memory can be held by one individual neuron as opposed to neurons in circuits? Um, 
in there all the microtubules in the neurons in a given circuit because we know that the memory is distributed going back to the uh days of lashley and, right, right. and carl prebum that it's kind of more like a hologram that it's not stored in any one place if you take a hologram uh and smash it in a billion pieces you take one piece and illuminate it you don't get one little fragment of the image you right, get right. the entire image but it's just less fu it's just uh, fuzzier and the same thing is true in memory so um uh it's distributed, but it's distributed in by in the microtubules. And by the way, Alzheimer's disease in which memory is lost is a disease of microtubules. Uh, we know about the amyloid plaques outside the neurons, but the end result is neurofibrillary tangles and disrupted microtubules inside the neurons. And that's consistent with the fact that memory is encoded there. And when you lose your microtubules, you lose memory. Uh, under your model, in principle, if you could ultimately have the... 100% uh, information at the quantum level, w could you recover uh, a memory or memories from an individual neuron in principle? The entire, uh, everybody's... No, yeah. Not necessarily entire, but... So. Well, you fragments of it. You, you know, it'd be like the, the little bit of the hologram where you're going to get the whole right, image, but it'd be right. real fuzzy. Right. So I think you could get the whole image. And in fact, it's possible you could even get that out of the retina. There's some uh, suggestion that photon echo experiments with interferometry from the retina, even though the retina is not conscious, it's, it's reflecting what's going on in the brain, and you might be able to um, interact uh, in some way uh, by laser interferometry and photon echo with the retina that way. So uh, applying the holographic model, yeah, I think to some extent uh, uh, the memory is, is everywhere in the microtubules, but uh, when, you only zo when you zoom in on one area, you lose, uh, you lose clarity and focus, but you get the whole picture. Because you do have a lot of capacity and information storage capa capacity based on your model. Within, Enormous. With, within an individual neuron. Yeah, 10 to the ninth tubulins uh, per neuron, that, and each of which can, can store many, many states. There's genetic input, there's different isozymes, there's post-translational modification, there's effective learning memory, and what's going on in real time. So um, uh, the microtubules can store humongous amounts of information. And uh, with a lot of uh, massive parallelism and redundancy, so you can afford to lose some.